This evening is a conversation and has been presented by Penn Perth. Penn Perth is one chapter of Penn International, a non-profit organisation that was founded in London in 1921. Penn's work takes place at the intersection of writing, culture and politics and currently there are about 150 centres around the world. As an affiliate of Penn International, Penn Perth brings writers together from across cultures to lead in and to share experiences, explore ideas and conduct public conversations about how literature transforms, influences and fosters cross-cultural exchange. Penn Perth is active on local and international issues, including questions of Indigenous incarceration, refugee detention and the free press. In particular, we campaign for the release of wrongfully imprisoned writers and advocate for responsible freedom of expression. If you are a writer involved in the literary community or you are not a writer but share an interest and concern for human rights, you are welcome and encouraged to join Penn Perth as a member. Please use the QR code up the back there on the screen or you, or on the screen, or you can visit our website, penperth.com, to find out more. This International Day of the Imprisoned Writer was instituted to support writers, journalists, bloggers and activists who are persecuted for their views and have to resist repression of their right to freedom of expression. Every year, Penn International uses the event to draw attention to several specific writers in their individual circumstances of repression. At all our events, we have an empty chair, which you will find over there, next to Omen, symbolising a specific writer who has been silenced. It is a powerful pen tradition. The empty chair symbolises a writer who could not be present because they have been imprisoned, detained, disappeared, threatened or killed. This year we feature Yang Heng Jun, who is an Australian novelist, scholar and political commentator committed to the advancement of human rights in the great, and greater freedoms in China. Yang Jun has been held in detention in China since January 2019, where he has been subjected to torture and other forms of ill treatment. The empty chair alerts us to Yang Jun's predicament and we call for his release. Um, it's also noteworthy that we have a picture of Baruz Pachania over there, which used to also be in the empty chair. <laughs> an initiative of Penn Perth on this day is also to host an annual lecture or discussion, discussion featuring writers to share their experiences, explore ideas and conduct a public conversation about the power and importance of writing as a form of questioning, <coughs> bearing witness, resistance and self-reflection. To paraphrase late Penn member and Nobel winner Tony Morrison, writing is a compelling and transformative force and tool in shaping public discourse and personal illumination. It gives voice for much needed change and better alternative futures. In the same spirit this evening, we are very fortunate to have three writers and collaborators who will explore the compelling notion of what it means to write freedom, writing freedom. So I very warmly welcome our three speakers this evening. Our writers are Behruz Kuchani, an award-winning Kurdish Iranian writer, journalist, scholar, cultural advocate and filmmaker. His memoir, No Friends, no Friend Like the Mountains, translated by Omen to his right, was written during his seven years of incarceration by the Australian government in Papua New Guinea's Manus Island prison. The book was famously written on WhatsApp, one text at a time. Amazing. His new book is Freedom Only Freedom and published by Queensbury. He is a life member of Penn Melbourne, I believe, and is visiting Australia from his home in Aotearoa. Which please welcome me.
And our other two speakers are Omen Tofidian, who is an award-winning translator, lecturer, researcher, and community advocate. His publications include Myth and Philosophy in Platonic Dialogues and Translation of No Friend But Mountains and Freedom Only Freedom. Would you please welcome And our moderator is Anne Surma, who is an academic editor and writer with an abiding interest in refugees writing about their experiences. She has collaborated with Beirut and Moment in the book Freedom, Only Freedom, and Anne is going to lead the conversation tonight. Would you please welcome Anne Surma? Thank you to Penn, the organisers of this event, um, to you all for being here, and of course particularly to Beruz and to Omid for sharing with us their precious time. Um, I'm very aware that we don't have very much time, so we're going to make the best of it. Um, in fact, before we came in today, we had a very interesting conversation about time, and maybe that will come up during the course of this conversation. Our conversation will circle around Freedom Only Freedom, um, the latest book, which is a collection of Beirut's journalism between the years 2013 and 2020. I'd like to start by asking both of you, Beirut and Omid, if you could talk to us a little bit about what motivated you to put these pieces together and collect them in a single work. And what it is that you hope to achieve through this publication? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Emil and Anders uh, actually worked on uh, this book. You know, when I was writing an article on that time, I think in the end, like about 100 opinion pieces uh, I wrote. And uh, so we have like 40. Three articles, so not all of them. So it's really important because we uh, try to put uh, them in different categories. So just to uh, you know, look at manners and look at uh, Australian, what I call exile policy from different aspects. You know, some articles are about uh, some individual, some refugees inside the prison camp and their stories and the people who have been killed that I did research about them or uh, you know, I asked their friends and I collected information about their background and I knew them as well and some articles are just about the politic you know, link manus to Australian politic directly and some are about uh, the manus in people as well because they are a part of this. So we try to just put all of them together that we have a, like a material that we uh, understand manus, you know, a billion manus, a common manus. Uh, thank you, Baden. Thank you, Dan, from Penn. And uh, thank you to all the other organisers. It's wonderful to see you. Um, there's so much to say about the, the reasons behind uh, the book coming together, but one of, one of them I think from well, one of them that I think is pivotal is that there's been a lot of focus on No Friend of the Mountains, and justifiably so. I think it's, it's fantastic. I think it's a masterpiece. Congratulations on everything that's uh, come out from uh, as a result of No Friend of the Mountains. But there's a, a whole history behind that. There's a whole context. There are all these other aspects and elements. Um, uh, the purpose of creative resistance began well before No Friend of the Mountains, continued during the writing of that book, and then uh, has continued afterwards. And this, what I, in my um, translator's note to No Friend of the Mountains, I refer to it as a kind of framed narrative. So the, the book represents a framed narrative, whereas there's, there's this other narrative, this other story around it as well, which I think is important, it, it needs to be told. 
um, and I uh, think more focus on other aspects of the creative resistance from from Manus, especially from Beckers's work. And no freedom, only freedom, I think, represents that framed uh, that frame narrative. And uh, also, I think that the second thing that I think is pivotal is that Beckers's writing, the creative resistance, the interaction with the, the various people that he was this, uh, referring to, um, the connections with all of us. This is part of a very special body of knowledge. It's uh, it's it needs to be canonized in a particular way, in a very important way. It needs to be looked at, researched, and of course acted on to make sure these sorts of things don't happen again. It needs to be people need to be constantly reminded that these sorts of things took place. Uh, it needs to be I think mean, ingrained in in history, in education, in amongst policymakers, and within um, the socio-cultural landscape as well, in general. So uh, maybe even going further than that, thinking about uh, freedom on freedom, like no freedom by the mountains, as maybe uh, the basis for a new epistemology, for a new form of a way of thinking. Uh, yeah, I should mention something. Actually, for people who didn't read these books yet, I think my suggestion is that first people read these, and know from uh, freedom on freedom, then read the uh, know from bottom up. And there is uh, something in this book is like that what you mentioned the moment, and there is a lack of anger and kind of anger that I like it. That anger because you know in personal life I'm not an angry person, but polit politically. I think there are many reasons that we be angry in this world, you know. So that's why uh, I like it. So as much as personal connection. Thank you. That's great. And I'm sorry, this is probably not going to be as natural as it should have been because we're going to be throwing this around a little bit. But we'll see how we go. Um, uh, I, I think perhaps you know taking taking on this idea and. Um, that the title of the book suggests, um, or is, Freedom Only Freedom. And for me, it's a haunting, mesmerizing title. Um, of course, it's taken from one of the articles in the book. But I think the idea of freedom and unfreedom echo throughout all of the pieces collected here. Um, and as I see it, you explore freedom as both quintessentially simple and enormously complicated, complex as well. And I think you challenge us to think beyond simplistic notions of individual freedom to confront how the freedom of some involves the oppression or imprisonment of others. Um, and you encourage us to think about freedom as a collective project. Uh, to imagine freedom actually in the most unexpected places. Um, and and I, I've been very interested to discover something that probably many of you will know, um, that the English word free shares its Indo-European roots with the word friend. And both of them come from the Sanskrit meaning love. Um, and that's a connection I think you make in this collection. Um, and so I'd love you to both talk a little bit about how you understand freedom and what it means to be free and whether there is a way of capturing that and how you've captured it. Um, and, and then, Omid, I would like you perhaps to talk a little bit about the ways in which the word free in Farsi offered or presented perhaps some challenges for you in the translation. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So I think we should just talk uh, about uh, freedom in the context of manners, because freedom is like a general uh, concept. Mm -hmm. So, but in the context of manners, uh, I think freedom uh, is like a collective desire, you know, or a, like a feeling that we, as a detainees, we share. And even if we didn't talk about it, 
we still feel it. We felt that we are fighting to get freedom. So freedom, of course, you know, is the opposite of opposite world of like being in prison. So it's so you know in the mind of a prisoner, yeah, freedom yeah it can be unique, you know. But uh, generally uh, that book, that's a title that comes from one of the articles. And uh, that article was when we, um, on 2017, when we didn't want to leave the camp, and they wanted to transfer us to another camp. And then we started to resist together. And at that moment, actually, the media, uh, the politicians, people, uh, Muslim media misrepresented us. They said that these people don't want to leave to go to another camp because they don't feel safe. But we said, no, we want freedom. We don't want to go there because if you go there, that means that you want to continue. So freedom was important for us on that moment and then come in the article and so then it became the, like the title of the thing. But as Omid mentioned, when we uh, talk about uh, Manus and refugees in Manus Island, you know, in the end we created a, like a, a resistance in knowledge as well, you know, and that again was like a collective resistance, you know. And when I talk about that, I don't mean only refugees there. That include people like Omid, people like you, and people who have been uh, standing up against this system. You know, or, and of course, people like you and Omid, you contributed to our resistance. So that's it, I think it's important that we acknowledge that. And that is the connection. You know, that connection, uh, that sharing love that you mentioned, I think that's really important that uh, during that siege on 2017, we could see that how uh, a part of society in Australia, they wanted to find a way to help us to resist, to continue to fight, and they did it, you know. So, I mean, that's really important. So, in this context, in the context of Manus, uh, that is my understanding, is that we should look for a link, you know. So, everything is, uh, you know, that is what we call, we talk about it, like intersectionality, you know. And we see different, uh, you know, people, different backgrounds, how they get together, you know, and they resist together, and also generally how we link Manus. I say that Manus and Naro are like unconscious side of Australia, you know. So when we talk about that, definitely we should link it with history of colonialism, with the colonial mentality in this country and also the long battle and fight and resistance by uh, First Nation people in this country. You know, we definitely we cannot analyze Manus and Nauru. We cannot understand it without understanding of this mentality, you know, because that reproduces itself in Manus and Nauru. So, in this context, in the context of Manus and Naro, for me, yeah, Omid has a very good, uh, created a very good, like, term or image, a tiny island and a huge island. That how that tiny island actually uh, challenged the big island, or teach the big island. I decided, I think it's a huge island. You know, yeah, that's, you know, this link is really important, you know, and now that I, uh, 
I've been in Australia, I met many people in Australia, and many places, even in Perth, there's the first day in time I've come here, but I've already, you know, been coming to this city through people who've been fighting here. So I met with uh, Michel Billy today, just now. So it's the first time we met. Yeah, I don't know where it's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel when I see Michelle, I always feel that she and her group were people who raised the flag of refugees in this city, you know. So I knew that I already connect with many places, connect with many people in Australia, and I think that is really important. So, but that is the collective. Freedom. Yeah. And that was really beautiful, Richard, and um, I think it inspires some of the thoughts that I've had now in response to your question. Excellent question. Um, actually, while we were discussing our plan for uh, this event and your ideas for the discussion, I was reading a PhD thesis by a, a friend. A very good friend in the Netherlands, um, Shai Nassiri, who I, I met when I was living in the Netherlands many years ago, and he just completed a PhD thesis on freedom and unfreedom in the context of refugees, and he went to uh, Greece and uh, collaborated with refugees in detention centres there, and uh, Lesbos in particular. And he, in part of this thesis, exactly the same time that we were discussing this issue of the, the relationship between friendship and freedom, it, I was reading the section in his thesis on the origins, the etymological origins of the, the term free. And the roots of the term, is, you're absolutely right, it, it goes back to, um, uh, you know, Europe, has Indo European roots. Um, also uh, in um, the Avesta, the Zoroastrian text, it's, uh, it's, it has um, other. Uh, other origins, I think Azava is the, the term that's used there, which is very, very close to Azadi in, in Persian and Kurdish. And I think uh, what was really remarkable for me was that originally, in, uh, and the same goes for uh, classical Greek and Latin, it's not a noun. It's not this abstract term that's referred to uh, and, and thought about. It's, it's, originally it was an adjective and refers to the people who participate in freedom, who, who freedom can be attributed to. And it has a, a very close link, the term always had a very close link politically to the relationship of the community building aspect, the effective aspect of, um, uh, of friendship. So friendship and freedom can't be separated in, in any way. The, 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 the two are in, uh, intertwined. And then just this discussion now, um, the, your question and Vedra's response made me, made me think about what really drove the translation process and also the collaborative activism we were involved in. And there were two things that really, I think, characterised that kind of activity. One of them is um, creative or literary experimentation. So much was unique, so much was really we were doing under pressure, so much we had to do um, in response to the unpredictable, the unpredictable, the absurd in many respects. And so we had to explore a lot of creative avenues, a lot of experimental avenues for trying to come up with the right response and in terms of translation, the right kinds, kinds of terms and, uh, or the right kind of framing, the right symbols, the right tropes. The other one is what I call a shared philosophical activity. And what I realised what was happening, what was taking place, was that we were part of a very special collective where we sometimes were uh, working towards the same goal even before we had the conversation about that act, about that um, approach, about that task. And we were actually in... Uh, philosoph philosophy is really interesting because there's the notion of, of one body, many minds. But here we had many bodies, one mind. Bezos was collaborating with many people around the world. Some of them, I, I had no idea who they were. I just heard about them. But we were all working towards the same project. We all had the same intentions. We all had, almost like we were, uh, our agency was one, was unified. And I think this is really special. And 
Uh, and you're part of that shared collective activity. And I think the, what's important about it, and what's important about the book Free Mind Freedom is it represents that shared philosophical activity with all the contributions that exist within it. And as it grows, it absorbs, it, it attracts more um, collaborators, more friends. We could, we could go back to the idea of freedom and friendship. You're all part of this shared philosophical activity now. And the only way for things to change is for collective resistance. So, if, if we also think more specifically um, about the use of a very particular kind of language, um, a, an original language that we saw in No Friend, but we actually see in the journalism as well, as you break convention, both in the writing and then in the translation, you break the convention of impartiality, objectivity. But more than that, you are not afraid or shy to use poetic language. The language that very often we know, but in the way it's used in what you write, it's as though we know it for the first time. You show us something in a different way. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your political aesthetic kind of um, impulse or motivations, and, and if that's for Ben Bruce, that's for you, and for uh, and Omid, how do you work with poetry and translation, you know, the most difficult, it's like, how do you do that work? Um, so maybe Ben Bruce first. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, actually today I didn't tweet about it, so I'm going to read it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so is, uh, I don't know that you are aware of uh, the not the like a political battle now discussion about the high court decision. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, and yeah, I say that uh, Australian uh, Australian refugee policy unfolds primarily through language, as politicians shape narratives that influence public perception. This particular case for that high court serves as a noteworthy example of how refugees are often unjust like the I cannot pronounce it criminalized criminalized, yeah, yeah it's hard for me to pronounce it. That is the language. You know, even in this case that we see that how the media actually are uh, following the official language. So there's two politicians, two sides are fighting each other. They talk about refugees and they talk about criminals. And the media just uh, publish their words. So that happened in the language first. You know, what's, uh, you know, in the, probably the roots of this policy already happened in the language happening in the world. So uh, I try to challenge that world, that language, that language that uh, created by the system, created by the, uh, you know, the government. And through that language, they decolonize, the, what I say decolonize, they dehumanize refugees. So the process of dehumanization happen in the language. So in this case that we have in the court, they are just talking about some few people, and even they don't talk that what is their cases, what's happened to them, what the crime they committed, and they don't talk about this, that these people already, they went in uh, prison. So they committed a crime, they put them in the prison, and then they came out of the prison, but they put them in the camp. So that is really important, you know, this language that they use. Because when you dehumanize, you know, it's really horrible. When you think about the hotels in Melbourne, that they use them as a, like a cage, as a jail. 
that people in the refugees in those hotels, they've been there, they were looking at people. But actually that was normal. <coughs> Why? Because already the process of dehumanization happened in the language and people of Australia, they find it normal. They see refugees less. So when you see people less, that means that you doesn't matter if they exile, if they be in the prison for 10 years or 15 years, they are, you know, so they are less. So I think that is really important. This language that is using the media, this bureaucratic language, this official language, and also the words that they use, like both people, you know, the Q jumper. Q jumper. Even they, you know, even today in that article that I read, that how Peter doesn't say, talk about refugees, the word that is used. Even Manus and Laro, they call them offshore processing center. Yes. But we were not in offshore processing center, we were in a uh, prison and even not a normal prison. It was a place to torture people. It was the place of uh, banishment. So that is really important. So in my world, I, uh, you know, I've always tried to create a language and a word to represent us. And in the same time, challenge that system, that uh, language. So I think using poetry and being poetry, even in the articles that are just about is about poetry, but you feel that power, that that poetry in that. I think that's really important because I just want to reject that, uh, you know, boring, even boring, not only you know, boring uh, current journalism language. You know, I, I was angry. I cannot write like a reporter in a Guardian. You know? <laughs> I say Guardian, actually, Guardian did a great job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Telegraphed. <laughs> the relationship between freedom, language, and translation. Wow, what a fascinating, fascinating um, area to, to talk about. Um, please stop me because there's so much to say about this. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to say that this issue of language, or the, the problem of language, the exploitation of language, I think that is something that exists right across this political spectrum. So it even exists within progressives or um, refugee supporters, or uh, I guess, uh, People who take a liberal approach towards uh, these particular political issues, you know, and and there's a, a kind of liberal humanitarianism that uh, needs to be challenged. I think when when thinking about refugees as needy, as victims, as supplicants, as people that need to be need to be safe, need to be supportive, and and rather than as people who are resisting, people who are uh, teaching us something about the realities of state-sanctioned violence. The people who are teaching us uh, so much about uh, the history of imprisonment in Australia. Um, it's, it's a penal colony, it was established as a penal colony, um, associated with the uh, dispossession and displacement of uh, First Nations peoples. And this penal colony has expanded, it's grown, it's morphed and it's uh, re uh, reproduced in different in different ways right throughout its history. So this, this idea of uh, refugees not necessarily as weak, needy supplicants, people who need to be saved, um, maybe even quirky or exotic, but, you know, but as more as people who uh, are ta taking a creative approach, have a particular kind of insight, have a, a unique position when it comes to these sorts of issues. People who can educate us about um, state sanctioned violence, people who we can collaborate with as equals when it comes to taking a stand against um, against violence of all kinds. 
I think that was really important for, for me to, to first of all recognise that it was taking place right across the political spectrum, and also something that I had to take into account when I was doing the translation. So there were certain things, I can't go into it in detail, but I have translators note in the book, um, in front of the mountains, in, in some of my other writing, where I talk about it in detail. What drove me to, to choose particular words rather than other words, or frame particular things in one way rather than another? And so much of this had to do with the fact that not only have I also experienced displacement and exile, and, and brought so many of the stories that, um, that uh, I grew up with into my translation process, but also my, my work on uh, racism, uh, particularly in Australia, uh, systemic violence, um, systemic oppression, uh, settler colonialism, uh, and, and so many other things. You know, it's also the politics in Iran uh, and in the Middle East and North Africa in general. So all of these, colonialism in, in general, so all of these things played a huge role in my translation. And I realised that what I was doing was the kind of freedom that Beckles was writing about and the kind of freedom that I was committed to politically started, started to uh, impact the structure of my translation, the kind of um, the way I designed or the way I moulded the content, the kind of kinds of symbols that I chose, the tropes, the, the, the context of the issues that I that I what, what I chose to emphasise, what I chose to maybe um, uh, not marginalise but uh, emphasise less, uh, and um, and also the experimentation that I was talking about before. So all of this was an act of freedom in itself. So there was this reinforcement, almost like a, a mutual reinforcement taking place. It was all reciprocal. The con the the Edward's stance, his his politics, his um, his creative resistance started to play a really interesting role and made the other aspects that I just mentioned even more powerful. And I think that's why the book was such a success, because all of these things Maybe the first time in history, all of these things really start to reinforce each other and make, each, make the book a lot more powerful on different dimensions. And um, there was a really interesting dynamic taking place there. Even our relationship, the way we work together, had that particular kind of freedom associated with it. I'll leave it there because I could go on. <laughs> I think that, that those answers are really powerful because I think what you've both done is shown the kind of dynamism, both of the creative process, but then the collaborative process, the writing, the discussing of the writing in terms of its possible translations, the kinds of arguments that I know you have mentioned, you've had discussions about how, how this might, these ideas might be conveyed or articulated, the ways in which language is yet another form of connection um, through which you together can produce this work um, for others, of course, then to take on and <coughs> as well. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I'm conscious that we don't have too much left. Um, maybe, maybe this question. Um, we're, we're all, I think, here very aware of how prolific a writer you are, how much you have written, um, and, and in particular, how much you wrote while you were on Manus, Beirut, um, and, and, and in fact, I think we also need to be aware, if we're not, how urgently the translation of that work was also done, um, and, and the pace at which <coughs> these people are working to generate and to be able to circulate this work so that we could read. For all of us here, Beirut, I think that you write in the way you do demonstrates enormous courage I wonder whether, for you, the practice of writing itself gives you courage. And does, does that courage ever fail you? And actually, this is also a question for you, Omid, as a translator. You know, does, uh, does your courage ever, has it ever failed you? Yeah, I think, uh, so writing actually for me, uh, Writing itself, the act of writing, that the sort of people. <laughs> Feeling and be aware of being a writer, that was powerful, that was important for me. So, 
when I arrived in Christmas Island and the Spanish people manus. Yeah, I told them I'm a writer, you know. And I think that was important, that the declaration was important, you know. Why? Because again, we should know, we are talking about a system that is designed to dehumanize people. So, to take your dignity, to humiliate you, and of course, you internalize that. So, what was important for me, that I was aware that I'm a writer. So, when you are aware that you are a writer, that means that that system, it's look at beginning very complicated, but you trust in yourself that you will understand it. You know? And also, so that I think is really important. Then we can talk about writing itself. You know, the act of writing. That was uh, important, but writing actually gave me uh, that courage that you talk about. Because through writing, I could understand the system more. So the problem with that, with the system, I mean that when you, yeah, when you understand that system, it's a very complicated system, when you understand it, analyze it, of course you see that you are above of this prison. And I saw that, you know, that's why in the end, my body was damaged, but my brain, my mind, I protected them when I came out of mammals, you know. And uh, I think that was, uh, if I say that I did that, this one thing that I really am happy about it, is that how I protected my mind, how I protect my brain, and how I protect my heart. You know, Andy, your, um, your question took me back to some of my early training in philosophy and some of my early research on ancient Greek philosophy. And, uh, you know, there is an example that Plato uses in his writing um, when he wants to talk about uh, the ideal of, of something, of, of a concept. And um, he, one of the examples he uses is courage. And he says, courage without knowledge is just a weak replica. It's not really, but it's, it's a copy. We've got to, through knowledge, we can get to the ideal of courage. And I think, so your, your question really helped me kind of um, understand how courage may failed me in some respects. Uh, approaching this, everything was so urgent, this kind of work. And I was working with refugees, displaced and exiled peoples for uh, many, many years before meeting Petrus. In many ways, it's been part of my life uh, growing up. And, uh, and so I, I learned a lot of things, and a lot of that I, I brought with me. But then I learned a lot of new things because what I what I saw happening in places like Manus and Nauru and other detention centres on shore as well was what I refer to as a neo-colonial experiment. And because it, so much of it was uh, was new, I mean, of course, it has historical roots, but so much of what was happening there was was. Uh, was introduced quite recently, especially with, uh, with new technologies of surveillance, the combination of the border industrial complex with the prison industrial complex, with the military industrial complex. All of these things, I think, in some ways were unprecedented. So it, it, it involved me taking new approaches, thinking about things, learning on the spot, collaborating and discussing with Bevers constantly to understand what was going on. And so many of the times that we actually came up with a response or strategy the system changed. The laws changed. The approaches changed. The terminology changed. We had to start from scratch many, many times over and over again. What we had been organising uh, was meaningless or futile because we had to we had to 
but take into account all of these these new um, introductions or these new um, uh, additions to the to the system. The, the system was very clever in this respect. It was um, deflecting a lot of criticism by constantly transforming, shifting the goalposts. So I think in this respect, courage failed me because I think I was you know, inexperienced and uh, and learning on the spot and um, and not understanding exactly what needed, what steps needed to take, take place, what kind of planning needed to take place, what kind of affiliations were necessary to actually make this kind of resistance, um, or make the most of this kind of resistance. Um, eventually, I think we got there, but not completely. So maybe courage definitely wasn't enough. Uh, just being courageous, a bit, uh, having an understanding of what courage involves, especially knowledge, incorporating the, the notion of knowledge was was vital and uh, it's something that you know we're, we're working on. I think now moving forward, I should mention that um, even with the the response to the the book, the two books, and many other things, this danger has crept up that it's become part of this kind of uh, capitalist culture, which tries to commodify everything, and so much of the collective resistance that we talked about, so much of the the outcomes that we were hoping for. The kind of um, knowledge that we wanted to share and, and develop with others, I think, watch this space, that's still to come. Because I think so far we haven't quite moved out of the kind of um, euphoria surrounding the, you know, the fact that these were typed out on a phone in a detention centre, sending them over borders, and, and, and the prices, of course. That kind of um, celebration, that kind of excitement. Is, is great, it, it invigorates, it, it, we need celebration in order to keep resisting, but exactly what they stand for, the principles, the ambition behind it, I think is still yet to come, so we can do that together. Talk about the system, how it changed or like that. So I did something on the system once, they told that I'm going to America, but I ended up in Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, so that was very interesting because when I was in Iraq in Vietnam, the Australian immigration uh, minister or something like that, they called the uh, units here and they were so angry. <laughs> <laughs> so we did something on the map. <laughs> Okay, I am aware that we should probably be wrapping up, but I can't um, let us go without asking you um, about your collaborations. Um, and I know that they're very important to you, the work that you do working alongside, um, whether directly or indirectly with other people, um, whether former refugees, uh, whether activists, community workers, um, other artists. Can you talk to us as part of our wrap-up about why these collaborations are so important and why they should continue? Yeah. Really, uh, no freedom will be freedom. No freedom but none, certainly. And in my translators, when I talk about the different people we collaborated with to make that happen, it couldn't have happened just with two people working on mobile phones. Um, uh, it, it, it required a lot of uh, interaction with a whole range of different people uh, right across borders. But Freedom Only Freedom is special because it takes that collaboration, it, it, it shows an appreciation to that collaboration that uh, is, I think, uh, introduces a whole new dimension. And I think uh, the, f the philosophy behind this kind of work um, it focuses on the the nature of collective resistance, and also not just collective resistance, but trans historical transgenerational resistance. How we look to the past in order to not start from scratch. Not we don't need to start from scratch every time we uh, we take a stand or we organise some uh, response or we take some kind of action. But we see what people have done in other communities that have worked. We see, and we also realise what other connections need to be made 
in order to take things forward. So this no, free model and freedom really encompasses that because so many of the people, including you, Anne, uh, we've been working with for years. And in a way, it's, uh, it's also a, a gesture of thanks that, that this was necessary in order to get to the stage that we're at right now. Um, there was something else I was going to say very briefly, but it slipped my mind, but, um, but um, it'll come back to me. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, one thing I should say about uh, freedom and freedom is what I like about this book, I think it is the history of, uh, you know, that prison, history of the policy. Because this article is written in a different time, you know, or in a moment. So I think that is really important. But that book is uh, for like, literature. So that's, uh, uh, you know, that's why you know, in this book we see many names as well, you know, many people that, uh, you know, we've been working with them. And I have history with them, you know, for example, uh, Ben Dorothy, you know, who been writing about this for many years, and he was the, probably the first journalist that I met on my phone, and we started to work together. So he wrote an article, so for me, it is a personal history as well, you know, or uh, even, uh, you know, Refugee, you know, Shamidan, who was uh, with me in Manus, and he wrote about it. We were working together, we were <coughs> we did activism together. <laughs> so that's why I think uh, for me is uh, like a, you know, a personal history as well of my work. Great. Thank you. Just very quickly, I want to add actually that. Since Behruz's achievements, since the output of so much uh, important work, many people, not just uh, people locked up in Australia's um, detention industry, but people all over the world have contacted us. And they've been inspired to engage in this kind of, um, in kind of activism, this kind of creative resistance. And I think well, that's been extremely inspiring for me. And uh, it, it shows me that there's there's a, a particular kind of approach, a particular kind of uh, um, uh, quality about this, this kind of work that is infectious. It, it, it inspires more resistance. And the same way that the prison industrial complex, the border industrial complex, is morphing and, and, and replicating it and reproducing itself. And you know, Australia's policies are now going global in, in, in many respects. And, um, and you know, these uh, companies who run detention centres and profit from people are uh, um, expanding every day, the resistance is also doing that. And we learn, it, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting that with so much, um, uh, so much depressing about um, border violence around the world, the people who are the subject of border violence are the ones who are uh, reclaiming the narrative and teaching us new ways forward, teaching us best ways to resist, helping us understand the kinds of systems that they're up against. And that is an expression of freedom. That in itself, people who are in situations of complete unfreedom are finding cracks in the system and finding ways to be free, genuinely free. Yes. You know, freedom is not just about a piece of paper. It's, it's about a, um, a particular kind of position. <laughs> Yeah, I think as a refugee, sometimes it is. <laughs> no, it's really, that is a part of my life as a refugee. So I know that, uh, that is philosophically important, but in a real life, so now I came to Australia, so I cannot have a SIM card because uh, it required a passport and I don't have. So I mean that many things like this, you know? So. Freedom sometimes is a piece of paper.
I'm really sorry, I want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but, uh, what Omid said was really important. I just I wanted to say that when we were... Uh, yeah. So, he talked about the, the empowerment that many people, uh, like refugees, contacted us all around the world. That's really interesting. That, that is one of the biggest lessons that I like, got from my work is that for many years, I was writing to Australian people because I was writing that people of Australia understand how that system is cruel and they, uh, you know, create change for many years. So the target was that. But in the end, I realized that actually, of course, we impact on Australia. But in the end, I realized that I empower marginalized people. I empower Kurdish people. You know, Kurdish people could see that the Kurd did, did this. And empower refugees all around the world. They you know, that they started off, oh, they can, by sharing their stories, by writing, by working, you know, they can uh, create some change, do something in this world. Not only refugees, like marginalized people, you know. So that's really interesting that recently, last year I was in Europe, and I met many of these people, and they were, they connected to my work in some like meaningful way and that was really interesting yeah so that was great i think that's a really beautiful way to finish really because i think it is on a hopeful note that difference is possible that's not to say it's not hard and long and difficult, but it's possible. Thank you so much. Omid Behrouz, thank you very much.